on the first Wednesday of the month, we, get, we come together as regenerative entrepreneurs all across the world. This is the only place where I could say that I want to see a tremendous growth in this industry is regener regenerative related industries. Hello and welcome to the Permaculture Brain Podcast. My name's Cormac and today we welcome Josh Pre Joshua Pereira. Welcome, Josh. Hey, it's good to be, good to be here. Thanks, Cormac, for inviting me. Well, you, you've got a very special number, episode 50. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> uh, I don't normally say the numbers, but it's uh, since it's 50. We've been doing them a year now, so <laughs> I'm well chuffed to get this far. Yes. Is it is is this the year marked as as of this episode? Uh, that's exciting. I yeah, roughly a year. It's episode 50. Uh, I think I'd done the first one last year in February. And then uh -huh. there were some barn spells, and I've, I've sort of picked up recently. I've done more than one just to sort of try and catch up myself. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. I uh, have been podcasting for a little bit, and I I feel like I have to take breaks here and now, uh, now and then. Um, but yeah, it's 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 good to if you can make it the year, I think you can you can make it for for several, right? That's that's my thought. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm happy enough. I'm enjoying it. Uh, still learning, mm -hmm. uh, and I love chatting to people, just hearing what they're up to in their journeys. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll get to yours then. Uh, Josh, how did you discover permaculture, and when did you first hear the term? Oh, uh, this is this is a fun one because I I really do like the the story that's that's behind this. Um, the first time I heard the word permaculture, I can't really recall. Uh, as it's been, I don't know, like 12 years ago, maybe, um, yeah, probably somewhere around there. Right. So I'll tell you kind of the story that's, um, I tell most people it was Emily, my wife that, that's, uh, found out about this weird type of building structure called earth bag, uh, uh structures. It's an earthen building type that's out of sandbags. Right. And I come home. My wife was actually, Emily was trying to search for uh, ways that we could uh, purchase or or build a home uh, ourselves with our own cash without getting a loan, right? And so we were trying to figure this out and uh, we were sustainability nerds, but we had never really heard of anything like permaculture. And she, and when I came home, she was really excited and she's like, I think she prefaced the conversation of like, I have to tell you about something and you're going to think it's really weird and probably going to say no. And she was like saying all these different things, but I think I really, really like it. I, I want you to say yes. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what, what is this? Uh, so Every we, uh, nightmare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or maybe a, a dream. I don't yeah. know. Right. So, <laughs> um, mm. so we, so, so she goes over uh, to the computer, we get on the computer and she starts showing me these, these images and videos and, uh, articles on earth bag building. It's, it's supposed to be this, uh, you can do it yourself. It's, it's, uh, you use site sourced material, except for the, the, the bags and all of these different things. And and then it looks like a super, uh, like an Adobe house and they kind of call it super Adobe as well. And, and I'm like, this is really cool. Uh, and so kind of long, longer, story into a shorter story uh that was the, like the beginning of our like regenerative or permaculture uh journey was this idea that we could build this home out of uh earthen materials and um and and try to create this self-sustaining home it was along alongside it alongside that we we tried to start building this home and we felt we ran into all of these different crazy challenges in doing so. Uh, we couldn't get it past code. We couldn't um, build in our, our current area. We had to go find it, find another place. And as we were trying to get all of these things, uh, because we kind of fell in love with, with earth bag, uh, we found out about permaculture because we actually had to purchase uh, a larger plot of land and then we started looking into like, how do we like, how do we do this sustainably? How do we get this larger piece of land and actually um, be greater stewards of it? Um, if we're going to buy land, we want it to be uh, 
greater stewards. And we had to buy more land because we had to do this more rural uh, experience with this type of building structure. So that was like the, the introduction. And once I found out about permaculture, it was almost like the, the big rabbit hole that we we kind of took with with uh, earth bag homes. And uh, it like, it, it just led to another rabbit hole and led to another rabbit hole, I feel. Um, yeah, so that, that that's the, I guess, around this, I, I, I can't exactly pinpoint when when it was that we found about permaculture, but we were in the middle of of building this this and trying to build this earth bag home uh, is, is is when I first found out about permaculture. Well, it more so on like the land design side of it, not necessarily on the gardening or whatever, right? But but, but then we started getting into the gardening side of it as well. Yeah, well, fair play these from taking it from that first step of the computer. You actually try to build it. A lot of people just stop there. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's that's a really positive thing. Uh and then so you mentioned the land design. How how did you uh sort of get stuck under that? Was it YouTube or yeah. uh, uh, courses or well we we had we had seen like PDC we were trying to figure out ways that we could like teach ourselves how to like responsibly um steward the steward the land and so we were uh, I think we ran into like the PDC model. We had run into uh, several different books, you know, um, obviously Bill Mol uh, Mollison's book, but the one that really like stood out to me was actually David Holgren's uh, book, uh, the principles and uh, pathways book. Right. And that when I was reading through that, it was more like I had found like a, a philosophy to look at, um how we how we interact with with uh our environment and and design uh in, in such a way and so that that to me was like like the what really started getting me to think about like this this property that we're, we're we were purchasing we didn't actually uh follow through with that particular property we got under contract and then realized that the cost structure was that we were going to have to take out a loan. And so it was like, not uh, because we, because of trying to get it past code, we had to do a different type of building model along with earth bag, which was just like post and beam in, in filled with, with bags. And so it didn't really make sense for us, you know? Uh, and so we didn't do that land. And then we purchased some land in Montana, but that entire time, well, then there's a big period in between when we, uh, got out of contract with that land and then got into, I uh, purchased our land in Montana. And that period of time, I was always thinking about, well, now I'm thinking about like getting more than like a few acres of land, right. To, to do this. And um, it was always, how can I turn this plot of land? And specifically I was thinking high desert, like, Everywhere in in Montana, Utah, m most of the land that, that you buy is usually in high desert areas, unless you're like up in the mountains, right? And and so we had found some high desert land, and so it was essentially trying to figure out how you can like rehabilitate this this very arid ar area that's also very temperate, and and that was really appealing to me, and just got me really excited. Uh, I'm also now in a very different part of the world i'm in panama which is definitely not high uh, uh high desert temperate climate but um yeah so it's it's it was that's where it really kind of originated was like how do i actively steward this land and do it in a way that's like makes it so much better than what it what it currently is right and and like transform it and in, into like a uh, a garden of eden essentially right was, and did, uh, was, did you did you eventually get the land in Montana? We did get the yeah. land in Montana and we, we spent <laughs> a big, uh, like three and a half years, uh, trying to build out this off grid farmstead, uh, that we eventually, uh, we kind of gave up on and it, I wouldn't even say gave up on, we, we, we literally failed, uh, by the end of it, we kind of froze, froze out. It was like either either we continue with we froze it out meaning like 
I was building on the property, our earth bag home. And Emily and I were both, we had three kids, three really young kids and, uh, uh, wait, no, two kids and one on the way, I think. Is that what, what was happening around then? I, I forget. And so we were doing all of these different things. We, we were, we were in over our head and I had, I, I was, we were both living the entire family. We had an Airstream trailer that was kind of acting as our storage and office and this fifth wheel trailer that was acting as our home. Right. And uh, that winter we had frozen out of that trailer. Right. Cause it got really, the first really bad snow snowstorm froze our, our uh, um, wastewater system. Right. Um, I couldn't keep it warm enough because we had uh, some some challenges with our our propane. Um, we had a propane leak, and so I, I literally had to move off of off the land. And when we were thinking about doing that, um, it was like it was like a breaking point. It was like either we continue doing this farm and we ruin our marriage. That's what it felt like it was going to going to happen because we were just at each other's throats. We were fr frustrated about. Uh, and uh, the expectations of what we were trying to do versus uh, what was actually happening. And, and, and so it was either that or go move back to the city essentially. And and so we decided we're not going to, we're not going to, this isn't going to cost our marriage. We're going to move back to the city. We'll keep the land and maybe we'll come back to it. And our, our dream was to come back to it. Uh, we never did. But so three and a half years after us initially trying to start that farmstead uh, we came back to the city <laughs> so yeah. but we did take the journey and it was it was definitely a learning experience well i guess what's, what's kind you went you tried it and you uh it's a permaculture principle and you sort of <laughs> make that change when you need to observe and yeah we, <laughs> anyway, we failed we felt a, a big permaculture principle which is slow and small solutions <laughs> because we really mm -hmm. bit off way too much we, uh, than than what we could actually take on and that was that was a huge learning experience for us for sure. Uh, uh I always forget the trail. I need to write them up in the back of this monitor so I can quote them better. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, there's a, there's a few that I just quote all the time because I have so many lessons around those. You know, right. So you you move back the land. Uh, so we'll not go through all the details, all the land details. I think that's a good starting point where you, you, your discovery. So you're. Profession is a marketer, is it? Or would that be, what is your profession? Yeah. 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 So around the same time that we found uh, out about like the earth bags, we also found out, well, I was also really diving into my career as a marketer and, um, and a salesperson, as well as, uh, you know, just an entrepreneur. I, I was getting involved with uh, a bunch of younger startups uh, of, startups that were my friend's startups. And I was so afraid to, to actually do my own startup that I, I got involved in theirs and went to school for entrepreneurship at, at the University of Utah. So that's kind of at, at that same time that I'm finding this this uh, this thing called permaculture and, and earthen building or, or natural building. I'm uh, I'm exploring my my career in uh, in marketing. And I started off with a, a really great company called Reading Horizons that we were basically selling uh, ed education curriculum for struggling readers. And it was a really great uh, research-based program. Uh, and I felt like I was actually like really helping to change the people's lives in, in that regard. And so I, I really got excited about marketing for a really cause-driven business. And it, that kind of led me into wanting to be someone that that's uh, creating messaging and, and building because I knew that it was so needed to get a good business's message out there. Right. Uh, but when I started actually working um, for other companies as an in-house marketing director, I realized that not all companies are, are created equal or, <laughs> or even ones that, that want to do good uh, or have maybe what they think is good is, is not necessarily good. Right. And uh, yeah, so I, I found myself when we moved back, um, I had been doing consult, con consulting work, marketing consulting work for a number of different businesses uh, while we were on the property. And that was kind of like able to keep us on the property while we were 
building the farm. But when I moved back, I was like, I'm going to create an agency. I'm going to uh, build a branding agency. And I found a business partner, a friend of mine who was a really beautiful creative. And um, he had won some awards for film and, and, and um, was a great marketer messenger as well. And so we got into business together thinking that we'd build this, this branding agency and we would have these huge budgets to work with uh, to, to uh, build pretty things essentially. Right. And great marketing campaigns. And again, I got into this space of like, I want to, I want to help good businesses. I want to help businesses that are actually making good change, uh, good change. But what I found is, they were kind of few and far between when we were finding clients, right? And so I started working in businesses that were very much my 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 skill set became high growth branding and messaging, right? And and marketing and branding campaigns that were for high growth businesses, uh, and helping them to get their message dialed so that it would really take off. Um, and that was a lot of high growth industries like consumer products. Um, uh, tech tech products, a, a lot of industries that necessarily did not need to see uh, growth, right? They needed to see more degrowth. And that was just obviously something that kind of tore at me because I had found about found out about permaculture, the regenerative movement, all around the same time as, as, as moving into my career. And that it kind of killed me a little bit to be uh, to have a, a skill set that I enjoyed doing, but also, being that skill set not necessarily being used for the, the ways that I wanted it to be used, right? Um, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are the same that they're in careers they don't want to be in. But uh, one thing I would say is try and use that skill set for good. I think you're a great example uh -huh. of that, and how how you've sort of uh, balanced the two, should I say, over the years. <laughs> <laughs> so how how do you get yeah, away? From, how do you get away from that? Then the yeah, so so it was it was a hard hard choice actually, and there was some sacrifice in that. Um, and so I I thought about maybe just finding uh, a business that I could work in house as a marketing director for that I could really believe in. Kind of going back to like my my roots uh, with Reading Horizons, where I really started learning my marketing skill set. Um, but I I struggled with that because. I felt as an entrepreneur, I had a really hard time not, um, you know, working on someone else's dream essentially, right? I I I would get involved in in uh, someone's project, and I would get I always get I always get really involved with anybody's business if I'm if I'm doing work for them or I'm working in the business, and I didn't want to get involved with another business and dedicate my life to it without like really truly thinking that I could dedicate my entire life to to doing that right and I had some entrepreneurial ideas that I wanted to to try out so that were related to the regenerative movement and so when I was when we were starting to get some decent clients with our branding agency I kind of uh ducked out and and said uh I'm gonna exit right here I know we're not doing <laughs> doing you know, like we're not the, the biggest brand agency. We weren't doing horrible, but we weren't, we weren't, we were just barely getting started. So I think my business partner was like, oh man, you're leaving me now. You know, he was a little, he was a little jaded about, about it. And uh, I, I, I'm like, yeah, I, I'm trying to, I'm going to pursue this idea with Emily. And so Emily and I, we exited our brand, uh, branding agency because Emily was actually a creative director in that that agency and we were doing a lot of the work all we were doing a lot of things all together and so we we moved out of that agency and, and we started this podcast while we were doing that just to kind of do the market market research for how we might be able to serve the regenerative movement in the way with our own skill sets right and and so it's the seeds of Dow podcast and i think we're on episode i don't know like one 130 or something like that and we've taken a few breaks in between, but that's what really started our our business, the Seeds of Dow business. We had this thought that we we have the the skill in entrepreneurship, we have this skill in in marketing and branding, and uh, we got to be able to utilize that somehow. 
But really beyond that, we were just exploring, right? We were talking to everybody we could possibly could, uh, could talk to. And uh, some of those came, became interviews on our podcast. Some of them just became really great conversations that we had. Um, but it, what we landed on was there, we were trying to scratch our own itch essentially of there was no support when we were on our off-grid farmstead uh, in a lot of ways, right? We were, our, our neighbors around us were looking at us like, oh man, you guys are, you're kind of funny looking. You guys are kind of doing something weird. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll help you out on, on building your, your house and whatnot, but uh, you guys are a little, you're kind of weird. Right. And, and we would get a lot of that. We would, um, we would get a lot of just not really understanding, I think. And there wasn't, you know, there's a big learning curve, but there's also a big valley of death for entrepreneurs that are doing regenerative entrepreneurial work. Whether you're starting a farm or you're building something in ag tech or, or soil or whatever, whatever it is, right? If it's doing regenerative work, there's a bigger valley of death than you have for a normal entrepreneur. And so we, we decided that that was going to be our, our business model is, is to build a, a net, uh, it's actually a platform. So our Seeds of Dow is a, a platform uh, uh, for education and support of regenerative entrepreneurs. And that's been our, our focus is to, to help entrepreneurs um, gain the skill sets that they need within their business and then go out and, and try to, to build that business, but be supported through incubation and acceleration programs. And what we're trying to do is also build out bioregional hubs for these entrepreneurs. So they have support networks in the bioregions that they're serving uh, or want to serve in, right? Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're still young in our startup. This this is, Seeds of Dow was essentially started right before COVID, but it's been an idea that's, we didn't quite know what, what it was going to turn out to be, but we knew we wanted to be in, in uh, we knew education was going to be a huge part of it. And we knew entrepreneur, entrepreneurs and, and business was going to be a, a huge part of it too. Um, and so our, our mission for Seeds of Dow, like right before COVID, when, when we were starting this, this uh, business was, and just doing the podcast and trying to get an idea of what we wanted to do. The mission was how can we build uh, local regenerative economies, right? Um, and we felt like the entrepreneur was that keystone species that was willing to take on the risk to, to make a difference and to work through difficult challenges and to build a community and build a team around those things and also work with other entrepreneurs to change their local economies and to change and, and therefore change economies uh, globally as well into regenerative ones. And so that that was our our, our uh, that was our beginning mission. It's continued to be our mission uh, as we've as we've grown into building out different parts of of this business. Yeah, it's a great mission. Just before we go into the sort of how you can help people that are listening, the permaculture professionals, they, do you want to just explain the valley of death quickly, just? Because I know okay, there's yes. that initial, uh, <laughs> it might be helpful for people who are experiencing this or d d that are in it and don't know they're in it. <laughs> I'm uh -huh, certainly, uh -huh. I'm on it. I don't know which part I'm at yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the valley of death uh, is is a term that entrepreneurs and, and people in the entrepreneurial space will often uh, refer to. Uh, and it's when... If you're looking at like a, a a chart of growth for a business, right? Uh, they never look the same, right? They're usually like, in reality, the business is like this, right? It's all over the place. But uh, some of the patterns that exist is like in the beginning, you're starting from nothing, and then you go into you go into debt, you go into or, or, or a, ri a very risky part of your business. Even if you don't go into debt for your business, and you kind of keep it, you know, uh, paying for. Uh, paid for by your own bootstrapped ability from a, a day job or whatever, you go into this very risky area that a lot of people call the valley of death and your revenue is is non-existent and you're learning and trying to validate the market. And then you maybe you get some revenue, but you're still not profitable because now you have some more expenses in that business, right? Uh, but eventually you you get out of that, right? And you're sustainable and you're making revenue, you're making profit. Uh, so it, that valley of death is when you're not profitable, 
you're you're very risky because you're very early stage. You don't really have long term clients or any anything like that uh, established, and and that's where Emily and I just really felt we could lend help to. But it's also one of those things that uh, where do you find the money if 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 uh, for for helping people uh, if you're if that's your if if that's your job, how do you find money helping people that don't necessarily have money or businesses that don't have <laughs> money, right? Uh, and so the the way that we looked at that was like we scaled to 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 working with uh, in the education side of things, right? And we we try to work with as many people as we can in there and and uh, diversify our, our services in ways that allow for um, those those entrepreneurs to. Uh, be supported while also uh, being able to support ourselves. And we could talk more about that as well. Yeah. So let's just take it that uh, I have I I go to your uh, I go to your monthly meeting. So, but just just pretend I'm a fresh permaculture professional, all full of enthusiasm. I've just started my own company. How can you help me? And all the all the yeah. different levels and stages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So right now. Um, our current services for for those that are that are just fresh, like they they just uh, are uh, maybe just, they just took their PDC. I like to think uh, uh, of a lot of uh, entrepreneurs that uh, maybe they've had a business before, right? And then they take their PDC. I've actually heard this a couple times in people's stories, and uh, they're like, "Man, my my." thought of the way business should be done is like completely new and, and, and changed now after going through my PDC. And so they come up with a business idea that's regenerative or, or, or permaculture uh, designed. And uh, for, for that entrepreneur, we have a, we have some early stage courses that you can get involved in uh, specifically. One of the biggest things that uh, is needed for early stage entrepreneurs is their marketing and branding and message. Right to be able to to get those first initial clients, you have to be able to to understand how to speak to them. Uh, so we do a lot of market research, but we have a course for for entrepreneurs to to go through. That's uh, one of our first course courses, and then we have a few other courses that are being built. Uh, some of them are on how you kind of uh, do some dynamic governance model modeling for your your business, and um, and so we're releasing some courses there, um, and then we're releasing some courses in finance and funding. Um, so. Uh, that's that's one way that we're helping is to give get these entrepreneurs uh, the the skill sets and, and help them build up competency in core areas of their business that are also taught by entrepreneurs that are doing regenerative uh, enterprise work, right? Um, and so they it, it could be a farm, it could be anything in in right relation to nature is how we're we're kind of defining these these types of regenerative enterprises, uh, and so. The another way is you can come to like you do, Cormac. We have a lot of free events that we do as well. One of those is our think tank event that we do monthly, and really that's just like a support network for entrepreneurs. We get together and we we chat through our challenges, right? Uh, you bring up a, a challenge, Cormac. You're 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 great at uh, being open and vulnerable, and that's something an entrepreneur has to learn is to be open and vulnerable and share what challenges they have so they can find solutions, right? Otherwise, we, if we keep those those guarded, we never find solutions to them. And uh, so that's one way monthly on the first Wednesday of the month, we get, we come together as regenerative entrepreneurs all across the world, uh, English speaking right now, but hopefully in other languages in the future as well, to, 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 to work through our challenges as entrepreneurs and think those out together and help one another, support each other uh, and collaborate. Yeah, so that's, I, that's another way. I really like that because it's a... Uh... Because I'm like a other way of partners we work with on various projects. I'm a effectively a solopreneur. <laughs> so uh-huh. to me, to me, that's my monthly meeting. <laughs> so I try to get <laughs> it. Um and just to hear other people. And just to me, it's encouraging that uh there's all our entrepreneurs here at different stages in their journey. And they're able to help you. And like the for me, like I was on it with Dan Halsey was there, and to be able to have that interaction with someone I may not have been able to talk to, and he was able to advise me. On starting where he's at a different stage, uh, mm-hmm. so I like it. Like I try to make them all. I don't. I don't uh, I'm a three of barn spell there, but uh, for me, I would encourage anyone, and it's the contacts you make as well during that that 
they see people do it. I think it's great that that's sort of like there's a showcase that there's other people in the same boat and they're actually successful <laughs> entrepreneurs out there. <laughs> so you'll not be in the valley of death forever. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, that's that's huge to just have someone that's maybe even like four steps in front of you, not even that far ahead, right? And so you can actually kind of relate to them and they can relate to you. And that connection is like, I think, really important for, for early stage entrepreneurs and especially those that are very impact driven, right? Uh, if you want to create an impact and you feel like you're an island and you feel very alone, you can easily get into burnout. Uh, and so having that type of support network and having um, and collaborating with others, I think is super important uh, in those early stages, right? To, to really try and figure out ways that you don't have to do it all, especially as a regenerative um, entrepreneur like that in itself, I think requires a certain level of collaboration. We're not going to be the big Amazons, Apple, you know, uh, Googles of the world, right? That's just this one organization that's kind of taking over the world in their own way. Uh, we're going to be uh, a bunch of smaller organizations that are collaborating with one another in, in a more regenerative um, uh, circular ec economy, right? Yeah. Um, a more decentralized, uh, decentralized yeah. network, people doing small things, but overall stronger. And then mm -hmm. no one person can dictate what, 10 other people's doing. So if you're constantly relying on big business to give you that feeder business, well, to, to me, it's it's much stronger decentralized again. And nobody's going to ever be a millionaire. <laughs> That's a, no, nobody gets into this business to get rich or get rich quick. <laughs> you know, that's something that I, I hope yeah. I hope that we can see more yeah. wealth in mm -hmm. the regenerative movement. Uh and and yeah, so I'm I'm not. I'm not opposed to making good money by any means and having a good, good, good lifestyle uh, in that process. Um, and I think we need to see more uh, entrepreneurs in this space uh, believing that they can, they can make decent money and be millionaires if they want to be millionaires. Um, but it, it's, it's not necessarily what they get into it for, like you said, right. right? It's, it, it's, it's for the, the passion it's for the change that they're trying to trying to build towards it's for future generations the big one of the biggest reasons why i'm doing this work is because i have four children and i get, i get depressed if i think that i'm not doing something to help help them live better than i lived right i think there's some news out there um typically in the u.s that they're saying that this coming generation like my children's generations the first generation to um, not have it better than than their the, the prior generation, right? Is what they're saying, um, and that right. we're, we're going into a, a generational decline uh, as far as um, you know, li livelihood and, and lifestyle. Uh, that's interesting to think about, right? I, I don't want that to happen. I would always uh, say, but by what metric, the mm -hmm. corporate's metric, or like, is it up to me to teach my children that the your annual income isn't the only metric you should be living by. It's and especially now we uh I think idiocracy coming up. Have you seen the movie? Idiocracy yeah, uh, with all this AI coming that basically uh a lot of the skills are being made uh sort of irrelevant. Irrelevant. So you have to go back to people and mm -hmm. go back to your basic sort of you have to grow food. You have to learn how to feed yourself. You have to learn how to take care of yourself. Because somebody's not, if, uh, the way the changes are going. So I think that for me, it's you have to change your metrics and change it to the, is it the eight forms of capital rather than just your annual salary? And that's what I'm, big part of my motivation is to teach my children all these skills. So at least they have the basics, they'll be able to food, water, shelter. And then mm -hmm. if, if they do well and they earn money, well, that's great. But at least they have that core skills. So I don't know about the. Uh, yeah, I would say, I would say that's very true. And easily, you can have a very good quality of life if you understand um, other forms of capital and utilize them in in your life, right? Um, and so, uh, if you're caught in the the current systems, and because I've been there, right? I've I've lived in 
you know, city areas where I felt like I was totally just like, um, unable to break out of, you know, the current rat race, you could say, right. And it, it's very frustrating, I think, for, for a lot of people. And I think for them, it kind of feels like that, like their children are going to be caught in this, this system that is not serving them. I think very easily, if you change your, your, your mindset and your paradigm, it, it can quickly uh, turn into a, a different type of lifestyle. Right. Um, but I also kind of, I also think that there's some truth in, in, the, in like quality of, of like uh, air quality of water quality, all of these different things that you kind of look at of like, what are my children inheriting? And that can be very depressing as well. And at the same time, if you're not only if you're not doing work to try and pr improve it is is my thought because uh, because for me there's a lot of i've i've chat, chatted with a few others about this as as well uh about hospice work essentially is what what we're calling like sustainability in my opinion right all this sustainable work is just less bad right how do we be less bad in our in our work and for me, that's very uninspiring work to be caught up in, right? Uh, you're basically just waiting for this system to die out and do less bad until a new system emerges, right? For me, it's very, very much more inspiring if I'm working with businesses and I'm working to build business that is moving towards a new paradigm and 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 creating a, a new mind mindset shift and and doing what we're saying that that brings so much more inspiration into my work and so much more energy um than than just doing less bad right uh, um no i agree yeah. i agree uh but yeah you sort of, most people start with less bad <laughs> and then they hopefully the dial shifts and then let's see <laughs> being positive and building their own communities building their own systems building their own networks and then working together so we got to the I uh, the monthly meeting, which I think is great. Um, what other services do you provide for uh like for the likes of myself? Is there yeah. a paid service? Yeah, so there's there there's a there's a few paid services. Um some some are a good fit for for many and some some are a better fit for others. Um we're building out those those course materials. Uh we have some some like one off. Uh, branding and marketing services that help you kind of get your your messaging right uh, and start to build marketing systems that are uh, doing mar doing marketing in what I would call a regenerative fashion right that's not just trying to exploit uh, for greater profits but actually really truly uh, building towards influencing uh, people to make better decisions to uh, that are are helping you to to create the regenerative change that you want to create with your your enterprise and there's there's those so we're, we're helping to create um messaging through that uh so more of a, a done with you or done done alongside you services rather than kind of the diy courses uh and so if you're interested in those i would i would love to to chat with you and then we're trying to go after some some just a few uh few businesses that we we know we can really kind of scale cuz we have to scale this is the only place where i could say that i want to see a tremendous growth in this industry is regenerative regenerative related industries right um other other industries we all we kind of i'm thinking degrowth is a great model for most most industries at this point right how can we slowly uh, degrow the, these businesses so we don't we don't destroy economies, but also transition our economy into to. But we have to scale up this work. So what are some? We're working, trying to find, on average, working with ten uh, really strong uh, businesses. What I would call like regenerative unicorns, right? And I have a really great a great team that we're developing in doing this. Uh, we're kind of growth, uh, a, a growth regenerative growth um, uh, service, uh, a uh, a regenerative startup studio or, or, or um, hopefully ev eventually a venture studio, right? And right now I have a, a really strong team member that's working on the finance side of things, getting people ready for, for like a, a really strong series A funding. If you, if you're familiar with uh, it's like, if you're pre-revenue that usually the funding round is called pre-seed. I'll give you those, this definition. If you're a, 
early stage, like you're starting to get revenue, you got your first clients, uh, but you need some some capital to to get consistent clients. You're you're like seed, um, um, seed stage. And if you're really ready for growth, you're you're between seed and a Series A uh, funding, right? And that's that's we're trying to build out a a good a startup venture studio uh, for uh, those those types of clients. And and we're working with we have a few that that we think are, are promising. And there's a there's I I would love to talk to you if if you're in this space space right now. Um, to, to really try to have some strong businesses that can be good role, role models for the rest of us um, and, and show us how we can scale regeneration and permaculture um, in to our, our local and, and larger economies as well. That sounds exciting stuff. A uh, couple of questions around that. So I'm born as bootstrapping, right? And I always thought that I'm never taking on investors or anything like that because then, then you're answering the investors and you're not answering to sort of other things and then things can go right. What what would you say to sort of allay them fears or would you encourage someone like myself to take on investors or, or go that route? I would not encourage most businesses to take on investment capital. Uh, I really wouldn't. Uh, you got to have the right investors, especially if you're an impact-driven business. Uh, or else it does turn into something, you know, like you get essentially put on uh, someone else's agenda and it becomes a part of a system that you're trying to work against, right? Uh, in in And trying to move away from at least. Um, so I wouldn't recommend it for many, but there is a certain type of business that we're, that we're looking at that's really needing... Uh, additional capital because it's going to take longer for them to scale or or they have something that needs to be commercialized uh, in order to, to to help us transition. For example, like uh, Brian Brian von Herzen of uh, he's he's a great example of this right now of uh, the Climate Foundation. Uh, you've talked with with uh, Brian before, I think Cormac. Um, he's been on on our monthly meetings, uh, and the Climate Foundation. He's one of the Brian's one of the, the kind of originators of, of marine permaculture. He's done a lot for marine uh, permaculture, uh, right? Uh, I remember him, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so in that, like, there's nothing commercialized about marine permaculture really at this this time. I mean, there's they're starting, but it's gonna it, it's a long journey for for us to see products and services in our local area that are der- derived from that type of. Uh, you know, even rest, marine permaculture restoration, right? That can actually support itself uh, and do regen- regenerative work. Well, that type of that type of business needs uh, philanthropy money. It needs all sorts of different types of money uh, and investment in to become commercialized. And and that's that's those are some of the businesses that we probably want to see uh, really get supported uh, to, to scale. And if someone's willing to take on the risk to start those types of businesses, we want to support them as much as we can, uh, so that we can we can all benefit from from someone that could scale that way, right? Um, and so there's there's things like that. There's things uh, that if we could start transitioning uh, some of our farms over to agroforestry, you know, what are some of the businesses and infrastructure that needs to be built out for us to be able to do that? Well, some of those, some of those things are going to take uh, additional capital because you don't ha- necessarily have the time to build it out, uh, bootstrapped or or it's it's not. You, the business would fail if you had if you had to bootstrap it, right? It needs additional capital. Um, it needs additional runway to be able to to get up or, or get through the valley of death and not just crash into. It, it crashed in the canyon, right? Yeah. Um, and that that's what I would say. But that's a that's a, that's not that's not every business. And I would say it's not the majority of regenerative businesses by far. All right, but you um, still work with smaller if, business on their branding and things like that, them services. Yes, wow. yes, and that's why we have the courses. That's why we have some kind of done for, done for you, done with you, kind of one off uh, services. This stuff is is like re- the 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 startup the venture studio is like we work with. 
no more than 10 businesses at a, at a given time. And it, we're working, working really on retainer, uh, retainer model uh, fees with them. Right. And we're, or we're, and a part of it is probably taking on equity. Like we're really investing and in, in putting some risk in these, these businesses ourselves, Right. Um, and so that is a bit of, of kind of the, the spectrum, I guess you could say, uh, we want to be able to transition, especially I love the thought of like, how do we get the entrepreneur? That's like what I was when, when I was going to school for entrepreneurship, who goes to school for entrepreneurship. I don't know. I do, but, uh, <laughs> the, if you get a student that's going to business school that or or any anything in in school but knows that they want to maybe they're an engineering degree but no know, knows they want to to start a business and and start a business that does good how do i catch that entrepreneur before they they get into the extractive systems and and just kind of fall in line with everybody else right and that's a part of what Seeds of DAO is about, right? We're an education platform so that we get early stage entrepreneurs, student entrepreneurs, and, and everybody kind of moving through that valley of death at different stages. Um, we're, trying to, we're trying to help them and do it in a decentralized way because I'm not going to educate every single, I'm not going to be the educator for every course. I have to have lots of education partners. I'm not going to be the only uh, incubator accelerator program that we're, we're referring to because there's so many out there that are doing great things that can specifically help for certain types of business. Right. And so we're, we're, we're being the, the, uh, we're being what we need to be for the network to, to flourish is, is our, our goal. Right. And so I'm trying to, it's a very hard business model that I'm trying to develop here uh, because I'm trying not to be competition for 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 an incubation or acceleration or an education company or even a bioregional hub area because that's part of our partnerships that we're building i'm trying to be a way to support each of those partners together right and put a, a, allow them to be a part of a platform that that helps and supports these entrepreneurs um because we have to see more of these entrepreneurs succeed and it's harder to succeed as a regenerative entrepreneur than it is for another entrepreneur in this extractive model because they're using the extraction exploitation to help raise up their business through this uh, valley of death. Yeah. No, I, I de definitely recommend you stay anybody starting out to join the community, uh, join the online community, go to the meetings. And even if you go to a couple of years, you're still sort of giving that encouragement to keep going and uh, to tap into the expertise that's there. Um, I think it's a great service you're providing. Thank you very much <laughs> from me yeah, yeah. for, for, for being there. Um, is there anything else that we haven't covered uh, along what you what you do or provide? Or you know, I I think we've covered a lot, and I, uh, I, I I do. Well, maybe there is something that I do want to promote and pitch is um, the bioregional hubs. If we can't associate our businesses to bioregions that we are uh, supporting. Uh, or that we are influencing. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we're having some of the hardest problems with entrepreneurship and business uh, enterprise building in general is uh, we don't uh, focus our attention on the bioregions that we're impacting, right? Um, and so if we can reassociate those those um, efforts, our, our entrepreneurial efforts into the bioregions, that we're involved in, that we live in, that we are impacting, like most of the 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 company farming companies that are making good money in Panama, are are U USDA organic companies <laughs> that are that no one sees those bananas, no one sees those cacao um, fruits in Panama. It just gets shipped shipped away to to other countries. Like how those business models don't necessarily serve the bioregions, nor do they support any regenerative um, model, even if they're an or organic farm, right? Um, and so the idea is to build regenerative um, uh, bioregional hubs for entrepreneurs to work together, to support one to another, to come to do retreats, to do workshops together and to collaborate. And that's that's a big part of the business model that we're building out. Uh, our first first bioregional hub that we're going to have ownership in. It's the only hub that we're going to take ownership in is in Panama, 
And the other ones, we're just going to partner with others uh, that have uh, places that we can host retreats and that are willing to gather entrepreneurs together, right? And there's a lot of those out there. So if you're if you're either a gatherer for your buyer region or you're a place where we can host events uh, in in a regenerative in a, in a regenerative inspiring location, we're looking for for those those partners as well. I'll get back even to get some land. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, definitely. Uh... And, or you can be the gatherer because that's what we're noticing is like there's yeah. there's they're not uh, they're usually not even the same same. Uh, same person they're 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 or, or same entity it's usually an entity or a person is is gathering people in the, their area to do regenerative enterprise build, building and then there's someone that that is able to host like they're a farm or they're uh, a retreat center that's done regenerative work and and they're hosting but they're usually not a lot of times gathering because they're so focused on just hosting people right uh, and so they're usually d- two different people and it's the other way that the person that's gathering doesn't really necessarily it hasn't been focusing on on building a place for people right and space for people um so it's very interesting that we're kind of finding through our research that there's two different types of partners in in each bioregion that's are kind of required for a, a hub to to really start uh to to take effect yeah so that's just i could just uh go on the website now and start doing that start getting involved in that as there yeah yeah, so this joining is the community is, is the first seeds of Dow, uh, dot com. So Dow is spelled like the Dow Day Ching. So it's T A O dot com. Uh, you can join the community. Uh, if you want to be an education partner, you just want to, you're an entrepreneur, you want to, you, you just want to have some support. Join us for the, for, for events. If you want to be a, uh, a hub partner, whatever it is, just you could reach out to me as well uh, directly. Uh, my email is joshua at seeds of Dow dot com. And then, I'm I'm very available on our our community chat and and other um, uh, spaces within within the community as well. Josh, that's been really good, uh, really interested. Hopefully, we'll get our course on your platform as well. So our course is PDC the professional. So where we take PDC graduates and we prepare them for the marketplace by teaching them digital design, some website yes. building, some social marketing, and then provide a lot of resources that we've picked up over the last couple of years, like yourself and ethical marketing, and all these parts of businesses that may be not so obvious to people who are just starting out. So we're trying to pack that all and get prepared entrepreneurs then for basically give them this package and let them, let them go and do their best. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, that's so needed. And especially for those that are, are really get really excited after their PDC and know they want to do something like that's like the best, uh, there's so many designers that we need out there and we just don't have enough of them. Um, um, after they get their, their PDC to really just dive in and know how to build a business from it. Right. Yeah. Joyce, thank you very much. Uh, that's been the Permaculture Vine podcast episode 50 uh, with myself and with Josh Pareto. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Cormac. Thank you.